Good afternoon. Um, good morning if you're in the US. Uh, and welcome to this session on um, integration of technology within the TVETS, um, TVETS sector. We are very pleased to have two uh, true experts with us today. Um, Esther Casicio. She is an ed tech uh, consultant and uh, co-founder and CEO of eLearning Solutions, a company called eLearning Solutions. She's based in Kenya. And she's also currently serving um, on the board of Technical and Vocational Education and Training Authority in Kenya. Um, and with us, we also have Gabriel Konayumo, who is a chief officer with the Ministry of uh, Technology and Science um, in the, at the Zambian government. Um, so I'd like to welcome our presenters. And uh, I think that we will start with, uh, with the presentations. If, is, is that correct? I think that should be okay. Is that with Gabriel uh, making a presentation? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you are able to hear me. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, we can hear you. Oh, all right, thank you. Okay, so I'll be briefly talking about the integration of educational technologies in Zambia. And uh, sorry, not in Zambia specifically, but generally, and then uh, end with an example of Zambia. Okay, so maybe let me start by uh, talking about TJ, TVET in a digital world. Uh, as we know, the TVET sector is operating in, in a digital world. And there is digital transformation that is taking place. And when it is taking place, it's, it leads to massive changes in the skills set that are required for work and life. So it's important for policymakers and those that are involved in TVET practice to be aware of this fact. Another thing also that's important as we set the ground is to realize that teaching and learning needs to address the changes that are brought about by the introduction of ICTs in almost all areas. So it's well and good for an institution to want to use traditional ways of teaching and learning but these do not help the institution as it is surrounded by a society that is increasingly applying ICTs in all, almost all areas of life. Look at, for example, banking. If you look at banking 10 to 20 years ago, if you wanted to find out your balance, you'd go to a bank and the banker would check your balance in a printed sheet. And that's how you only you could get to know your balance, but now you can do it uh, using a mobile phone. Maybe important to stress also is that digital transformation requires fundamental changes in the way that TVET is, is delivered. So TVET institutions need to provide all the citizens in their country with the knowledge, skills, as well as attitudes as 
in, in addition, even life, lifelong learning opportunities that are required for living and working in an increasingly technology-driven environment. So it's important as institutions are teaching that they are bearing in mind that the people that pass through the institutions need to be given these skills to be able to survive and work in an increasingly technology-driven environment. Well, it's also noted that all citizens would need to have to invest central skills, including basic skills when it comes to uh, ICTs, but there is also a need to, to have high, there is also a high need for qualified tevet graduates who have specialized ICT skills in their various fields so that they're able to apply them when they join the various professions. It's also important to note that there is need for TEVET to develop a culture of sharing and openness. Now I say this that because uh, in our context, for instance, we know that uh, institutions have to compete for learners, they have to compete for students, and sometimes because of competing, the tendency is to want to hide certain information, certain best practices, and not want to share even teaching and learning resources. But if TEVET is going to develop, we, mean, we need to develop a culture of sharing and openness, open textbook, open educational resources, and so on and so forth, open pedagogies, so that we are learning from others within uh, Zambia and outside Zambia. Now, maybe talking about, uh, I think, sorry, the slides were mixed up. Let me, I come to the other one. Uh, Tevet in a digital world, still looking at that. Another important thing to bear in mind is that networking is of utmost importance. It's one of the most important resources that we can think about. So UNESCO Univoc, the Tevet wing of UNESCO, aims to produce or to promote the use of technology in three ways. Uh, one of the ways is contributing to the creation of policies, so helping different nations that are members of the UNESCO Univoc network in order to develop ICT policies, which can be used to change the way teaching and learning is done and to integrate technologies in TVET. But also supporting ICT related thematic programs in areas related to artificial intelligence, mobile learning and OERs. And lastly, sharing resources and promising practices in technology enabled teaching and learning context. Another important thing to notice as we talk of focusing or rather on TVET in a digital world is the need to focus on quality TVET training. A lot of times when people talk about um, the great in ICTs in TVET, uh, obviously the, ch the challenge people think that for practical programs, then how are you going to integrate technology? Maybe it's not possible and quality will be compromised. But that's a discussion for another time, but let it suffice for now to realize that if teachers, are, if we're going to integrate ICTs in teaching and learning, the teachers need to be central to the introduction of ICTs in learning environments. They need to be involved. Uh, just a, a couple of years ago, the International Labor Organization started some studies, uh, teach, teachers in a digital world, of which even Zambia was involved and uh, Twambo from TVTC and Alice uh, Shemi from CBU and myself were engaged to research on teachers in a digital world and how the teachers had operated during the pandemic and after the COVID pandemic and how they were adopting the use of ICTs. So we see that teachers are quite central in integration of ICTs in, in teaching and learning. Now, maybe specifically talking about uh, Zambia, the integration of ICTs in the TEVET sector in Zambia. It's quite clear that the COVID pandemic brought to the fore the need to consider the use of ODL and ICTs in TEVET. Previously, those that felt that you could not teach 
some programs in Tibet at the distance. Now we're trying to see how can you use technology enabled learning to reach out to students who cannot come to class because of the pandemic. Of course, there were a lot of trial and error. For those that were already teaching using distance learning in certain programs, the adaptation was easier. But for those that were previously on using in-person or face-to-face, -face, it was quite a sharp learning curve. There were a lot of challenges first, uh, bandwidth on the student's part, and also poor internet connectivity in various parts, even in the capital city, depending on where one is staying. And uh, generally, even lack of digital ICT, digital skills by the lecturers and the students. But opportunities were identified also uh, in terms of using technologies, ICTs in teaching and learning. The role of stakeholders and partners became prominent. Uh, for instance, UNESCO was able to share policies for ICTs in integration. We talked of ILO and the studies that were conducted, but ILO also switched the, the training that they normally have in person in Turin for various aspects of TVET to offer it online. And they targeted people in the ministry and also in TVET and learning institutions to attend uh, online uh, courses. For example, there was one e-learning lab e-learning uh, lab in Tibet, and they are basically the sharing various tools and uh, how you can digitize Tibet. But also to mention that the Commonwealth of Learning uh, also was partnered with the ministry and Tibet and other Tibet institutions in building capacity in, in lecturers in terms of online facilitation, where some staff from TVTC and from the ministry of which I was one of them, uh, conducted uh, training in online facilitation to members of staff, 28 initially, and these 28 were trained, then trained 600 others from the 28 private institutions under the ministry. But this year we also had a, a course, uh, technology enabled learning, leading change in technology enabled learning for, for TVET where leaders in, in Tibet were trained over an eight week period in various aspects of leadership in Tibet, which culminated in the development of institutional technology enabled strategic plans, uh, which the Commonwealth of Learning is keen to support till these are implemented. But also to mention uh, that uh, there's been an ICT competence framework that uh, UNESCO helped develop, it was uh, localized for the Zambian context. And uh, this ICT competence framework basically brings out the competences that are required of teachers as they teach using technology. And this was a project that was being done with two teacher training colleges, one Charles Longa, uh, teacher training college, which is under the Ministry of College, and then the other one, the the Technical and Vocational Teachers College in Wansha under the Ministry of Technology and Science. So it is expected that as this project moves into the next phase, other lecturers, uh, other institutions rather will be integrated and will learn from what the other institutions have been doing in terms of integrating ICTs, building capacity in, in staff in using ICTs in teaching and learning. So I'll end there for now, maybe for reflection, something that we may look at later on is if you are looking at your context in your own uh, institution and you're seeking to promote uh, change in the use of technology and about learning, how would you deal with those that do not see the need for change and feel that now that the pandemic is over, that perhaps they can go back to the way they were teaching before and others who are really persuaded that you cannot use ICTs in Tibet. How would you deal with such? Uh, we can hold on to that question as I end here. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Gable. Would you like to come in now, Esther? Um, thank you so much, uh, Tony. And thank you, uh, Gabriel, for taking us through that portion. Um, more so about uh, what uh, what Tibet are all about and what is expected. So I'll just run through a few uh, areas uh, just to help us appreciate, again, sharing a case of Kenya, just be able to appreciate what this digital transformation means. Um, and I may start by saying that the digital, I mean, the transformation in Tibet in Kenya started uh, back in 2013 when the government decided to look at a way or look into a way of regulating um, to the Tibet sector before everyone was doing everything. The, the trainers were not well trained. They were not well remunerated. The, there were not really like, uh, there were no such structures that would enable us to say that we are running an efficient and effective Tibet sector. So in 2013, through an act of uh, parliament, uh, number 29, uh, technical and vocational education and training uh, as, uh, uh, was regularized and uh, the authority uh, known as the Technical and Vocational Education and Training Authority was established by the same act to oversee all the aspects to do with, um, to do with Tibet. I'll mention a little bit about them as we move along. Uh, the reform also went on to look into the curriculum and we had a curriculum reform policy in 2015 uh, that set the pathways for establishment of competency-based education and training, that is CBET. And this is now aligned to the new curriculum that we already currently are having uh, in, the, in the basic education sector, which is competency-based in nature and which fits into the TVET as one of the pathways. Um, and then, uh, maybe it's worthy also to mention that uh, the Tibet, um, Tibet in Kenya is under the Ministry of Education in a state department called the Vocational and Technical Training, which has two departments that look at, at the various trainings. Um, I want us also to appreciate the, how big Tibet is in Kenya. Uh, currently, we have about 2,203 Tibet institutions that are accredited. And as I mentioned, the accreditation is done by a Tiveta or the Tibet Authority, who is mandated among other things to promote access, equity, quality, and relevance in technical and vocational education and training by regulating, inspecting, registering, accrediting, licensing institutions, and also programs. They're also mandated in a licensing, registration, and accreditation of trainers. Now, this part about the trainers has been the key, um, uh, the, the key ingredient that is necessary to ensure that transformation of whatever form takes place in the Tibet sector. As we are going to see, it is one of the challenges that we've had in even trying to bring in, uh, or to, to bring in um, um, digital transformation within the sector. Um, again, let me just also mention for us to appreciate the magnitude of Tibet in Kenya and how many uh, or how big the Tibet sector is in the country. So Kenya has about 12 polytechnics, national polytechnics, and the national polytechnics are semi-autonomous. They are able to carry on their own programs and do everything with the oversight from the Ministry of Education and also from Tibet. Then we have one training arm or one training institution that is supposed or mandated to train all the instructors across all the institutions that we have. Again, you're going to see that this is one of the major, um, major challenge that we have with only one institution taking care of all the tutors and instructors across the country. One to to, uh, to bring in competency-based pedagogy into uh, Tibet training, among other things. So you'll see that bringing in also education technology on top of wanting to first make them or streamline them to being well-trained instructors is also a big, uh, a, 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 a big um, thing to do. So we have one only of such institutions. It is now that we're trying to figure out how can it be worked on so that um, it's able to reach more and more trainers um, 
and be able to perform its function in a more efficient way. One of which is actually through the use of technology uh, to reach more, more trainers wherever it is that they are. And remember all these institutions are across the entire country. Then uh, we have uh, technical and vocation centers. We have 259 public and we have 829 private. Total of 11, uh, 1,151. These ones are, are managed by the national government and the national government also oversees the private. Note here that the private institutions are more than the public institutions. And this is because we have very, very many professional, um, many colleges that are offering professional education such as business education and that kind of thing. Then we have the vocation training centers and we have 953 which are public and 87 of them who are private, making a total of 1,040. And these are devolved to the county government. So everything about them is managed at the county government. Now, the problem with this aspect is that if, unlike the national government where once a policy is made, it cuts across all the national polytechnic, uh, sorry, all the national, the technical or TVCs that are under the national government. The vocational training centers um, are managed from the county level and they are resourced from the county level. So if the county government does not find them a priority, this is an area that is not going to be looked into. And that is why we've had quite diverse uh, differences across all the counties in how the, uh, the vocational training centers are manned. Some countries, they are doing very well, others are doing very badly. In some counties, uh, they have embraced technology and you can actually see how they, they, use, technology, um, they use technology in delivering learning. Uh, but in other countries, it is a totally forgotten thing. Now the challenge in there is how do you harmonize so that all the colleges are on the same level, especially for those that are under the county government. We always say that there is no uh, student who is a national government student and the other one who is a county government Students. But however, this is a political, um, it is a political item that will need the politicians to go back and sit and see how they can bring all of them on board. And then uh, we have other institutions across the country that are Tibet in nature that fall under different other um, uh, ministries, and those are also all regulated under the Tibet. So I wanted us first to also understand. And as we go on, think about also the institutions that we have and the differences that the institutions have in, in the countries that you're coming from. Now, when we're thinking about this traditional uh, transformational, um, digital transformational aspects, what is it that makes us want to think about it? What are the challenges? What are the problems that we're thinking about or that are driving us to want to integrate the technology in the way we do things? Now, I've mentioned a few challenges that we've been having uh, before in terms of even governance, in terms of structures, in terms of uh, who funds what and stuff like that. And those are huge, huge problems by themselves. Then there are other challenges that now um, have compounded to make a good situation or a bad situation worse, as we may say. And uh, some of those in my country and, uh, are, would include, like, for example, in Kenya, the Tibet institutions for a very long time have been, dis uh, have been perceived as um, desire, are not seen as appropriate. They are not seen as desired higher education destinations. And unfortunately, this reality has really grown roots in Kenya, and it is something we are trying to get out of, where we see Tibet institutions as places for failure, as places for those who did not qualify to go to the university. Now, we have all these institutions I've talked about, and all these institutions have great capacities of accommodating more than 250,000 plus or 500,000 plus students. Um, every year we graduate about 600,000 students from, from uh, high school, and only a third of those go to the universities. Three thirds are supposed to get into these institutions, but because of the way these institutions have been branded as places for failure, we find them not getting takers. And unfortunately now, we'll find so many 
young people who are unskilled because they did not want to go to the Tibet because Tibets are not places for them because they are not or they don't perceive themselves as failures. That's one of the major challenges in as far as Tibet is concerned. And even when we try to reform and find how to make uh, Tibet more uh, uh, better places to be in. The other challenge I would mention is that there is no significant use of technology in Tibet, despite the fact that um, the students are expected to succeed in a technology-driven environment. And Gabriel has alluded to it. In most cases, um, you'll find that even the infrastructure to use technology is not there. Um, so technology-driven learning in Tibet in my country has been a challenge for a long time. Now, this was coupled by COVID-19. When the pandemic hit, everything went down, everything went to a lockdown. Unfortunately for the Tibet institutions in Kenya, unlike the basic education, they closed. Nothing happened. No virtual learning took place in Tibet. They closed and opened way after about a year or so after the COVID. The impact of that is that not all the students who were in college before COVID went back. Reason being, their education ended at the point where the COVID came and the lockdown happened. Now, even with this realization and even with the learning that we have gone through during the times of COVID, there's still little, if any, resilience in the Tibet sector to enable continued learning in, in the wake of the pandemic or any unforeseen crisis happening again. The other challenge we have, which I have alluded to as I talked, is that the tutors and the instructors lack the adequate skills to use technology in training, as well as in conducting research or using technology to develop content. That area, even digital, basic digital literacy skills are, are very uh, inadequate for those, if any, who have them. Then the other major challenge is on the curriculum that the curriculum as is does not address digital literacy issues, neither does it uh, foresee the use of technology to deliver curriculum. And even after the pandemic, the efforts to work on this are still minimal, based on what I have also mentioned earlier on, in that we do not have the capacity to do that. And the capacity that is kind of uh, meant to help us out is also lacking. I don't know how the situation is in the countries that you're in. So, what is it that we want to do? Or what is it uh, that we envisage doing in as far as transforming the Tibet sector to include, uh, to adapt or adopt the use of technology? And in this case, when you're talking about use of technology, we look at the very basic ones that are there, using technology to deliver learning, uh, ability for the instructors and the trainees to use or exploit technologies in the learning and even research, adoption of probably a hybrid like we saw in the some of the basic institutions and the universities where they adopted a hybrid model where they had in-person and remote learning or virtual learning or e-learning taking place at the same time to ensure that learning goes on. So that is what we envisage uh, as a start, as a uh, transformation in, in, in Tibet sector in as far as technology is concerned. To achieve this, um, we see as uh, having to do a few things. Uh, for example, deploying some of the components such as probably we might want to rethink and think about a deployment of a management system that will enable us manage the Tibet, um, uh, the Tibet matters in a more efficient manner. Probably we might need to acquire a national learning management system on which we are going to, uh, to run the e-learning uh, programs or the training programs that are going to happen. Um, and um, there's something probably we'll discuss that later, a question that Gabriel has asked in the regard to uh, practical aspects of Tibet doable using technology. So those are some of the things that we probably would want to think about even as we think about the learning management systems that would need to be deployed. Then we're also talking about revising the curriculum to make it digital competency-based, as well as incorporating digital skills and integrating uh, using it on delivery of learning. A big one here is on capacity building to develop the local expertise in terms of using technology in delivering learning, in terms of uh, using technology to develop um, content that is going to be used in the training and so on. Of course, we are all in Africa mainly 
having a challenge in internet connectivity, it's something that would probably need to be looked into. Uh, in Kenya, we may not have a very serious challenge because if you look at the internet uh, penetration within the country, we are, not in, we are not very badly off, the 3G, 4Gs and so on. We, I think, are uh, now more than 70% in terms of penetration. So again, that would not be a very big problem if it is well enhanced, it is well uh, explored and exploited. Of course, a bigger one here is devices and productivity tools that would need to be looked into if we are going to get towards that. And a big one that we are working on is rebranding of the Tibet sector, rebranding to ensure that we are now changing the narrative that, um, that Tibet are places that you can actually acquire skills. And especially now where the hands-on skills are limited uh, and to get plumbers and well-versed technical people with hands experience is so difficult. Then it is time that we now change the narrative and encourage more people to take up the, 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 to take up the courses in Tibet and more so also bring in technology to enhance that kind of training. And then finally, mapping the digital transformation to the overall Tibet transformation. So I'm just going to run through um, one last um, two, just two last areas that I think are important for this discussion. And one of them would be what do we stand to gain with the digital transformation in the Tibet sector? And one of it would be providing training and education that is relevant to the current and future job requirements. Because there is a mismatch of the people we are shunning out from the institutions and what is expected in the labor market or in the world of work. The other benefit would be to achieve oper uh, operational resilience, the ability to respond to, adapt, and recover from any disruptions like we saw in the COVID uh, pandemic period. And then also, as I talked about changing um, the narrative and promoting and rebranding Tibet to attract an increased number um, and broader range of potential students by enhancing the image of the Tibet sector. And we have a broad spectrum of where to tap these students from, from high school graduates who are not absorbed to the university, to the youth of all ages, um, that understand the unique value of Tibet education. We have professionals seeking continued learning opportunities to enhance their current education or for personal interest. And these are also our clients in the Tibet and also international students. Also, the other benefit we can mention here is attract and maintain a higher caliber of faculty uh, coupled with a revised curriculum. This will in turn raise the caliber of Tibet graduates. So we need to focus um, a lot on the training of the instructors so that they are well equipped and well versed with the right training for them to be able to deliver this. The other benefit would be attract increased support from the private sector. If we have a well versed uh, and well trained um, uh, student or, or trainee base, then we will, uh, we will invite and, um, and attract the private sector and therefore they will take up those whom we have trained and help sort out the unemployment issues that we are talking about. The other benefit is that once we, we will be retraining or retouring the trainers and tutors and instructors on integrating technology in teaching and learning, um, which includes teaching, facilitating, training, as well as in research and developing digital content to enhance learning. So using that information on technology, they'll be able to broaden their horizon and be able to broaden on how they look at how they look at various ways of training. Use online assessment and real-time analytics to track learners' progress, which has been a challenge even now. And then the other benefit will be to well entrench monitoring and evaluation of Tibet programs and institutions to ensure uh, improvements and standards. Uh, just to mention the pillars that could support this, uh, we'd have uh, about 10 of them, starting with infrastructure, platforms, content, devices, trainer readiness, support, security, communication, funding, and policy. So far, uh, as a country, we've made some strides. We've been able to incorporate a few things. Uh, as uh, we have the Odell standards reviewed to, incom to incorporate uh, remote and virtual learning or blended learning. Um, then we are also working with uh, like-minded uh, 
institutions or training institutions to help us restructure our, uh, the tech, our technology journey. We are working with Commonwealth of Learning who are offering trainings for instructors, helping KTT see that I mentioned is a training arm on how they uh, equip the digital skills to the instructors and how they move on uh, out, uh, or how they um, spread those skills to other institutions across the country. Uh, the Tibet, the Tibetan Authority is working on various initiatives uh, so that we are able to ensure that this um, transformation takes place. And now working with partners who will fund some of these initiatives. So far, we've been in discussions with various uh, bodies such as the World Bank who have funded certain activities. We have the MasterCard Foundation, we have the banks, among others. So basically that's just an, in a nutshell what is happening and probably uh, help us contribute towards the reflective question that Gabriel has given us. Thank you very much. I will stop here and then we can progress and probably enter into the discussions. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very Thank you. much, Esther. Gabriel, do you want to ask your question again? Yeah, so basically, the question is, uh, how would we deal with those you know, institutions that are resistant to adopting ICTs in teaching and learning? Do we just leave them and hope they'll, at some point, get to to appreciate the use of technology or do we force them to use technology? What do we do? You can share even from your experiences. Any thoughts from anyone here? Please feel free to unmute and tell us what you think. If we stay silent too long, what I'll probably do is to put people into breakouts for a few minutes for a bit of a bit of warm up, a bit of thinking about what you might want to say, and then come back into the main room and we have the conversation. How would that sound to you, Esther and Gabriel? Um, I think we are not very many. We are about 12. If people warmed up, it would be more lively if we could bring out the discussions out here. And okay. maybe uh, my, I was thinking that uh, maybe, Gabriel, you could put the question on the chat uh, so thing. that we look at it. And then maybe from there, we are able to, to kind of discuss. OK. I got the question in the chat already. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do is to actually break us into breakouts for literally just three minutes for a little bit of warm up um, in groups of two or three. And then um, we'll come back and continue from there. Opening all the rooms right now. Catherine, I'll assign you to a room as well. Um, and if you can't get to a breakout room because of your bandwidth issues, then, you know, feel free to come back to the main room and we can check in here. I see Chulunda, you're still here. Chulunda, how are you doing? Okay, everyone's gone. Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope there were a few sparks in the breakouts. 
Um, and yeah, if you want to um, tell us what you think, please just take the mic. How is it everyone is still silent? Well, Lubita, it looks like your mic is on. Do you want to talk to us? Well, I, I was just responding to the question to say, um, during this era, the, 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 this is the, the, the technological era, uh, the, the, there's no way that uh, people can be left behind. Maybe we just have to get them on board and uh, give them skills relating to technology. Okay, but Walubita, um, what if they don't see the need for the change and they're going to fight this even quietly? How do you get them on board? Maybe we should uh, look at the advantages of uh, technology. For example, uh, we can blend our learning and look, uh, find a way of convincing them to see that this improves our teaching. If it's, uh, for example, blended learning, if they can see results when somebody's applying blended learning, probably they could do, get on board. Okay, some good thinking there. Gabriel, come in. Gabriel Nepo. Well, um... I think it all lies within the, the change management efforts of, of, an, of an institution or of an organization. You no, know, it's, it's, it's usually very easy to, to label uh, um, staff or members as to be resistant to change and stuff. But perhaps as the, 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 um, the change agent, the exchange uh, agents, we need to also reflect as to the methods and the way we, we introduce that change. Of course, there are some changes that, that for example, that, that are usually advantaged by a situation like COVID. That was the, the um, people have no choice, but there was, that was so drastic. But when the change is planned, when the change is, when you plan to implement change or to effect change, it shouldn't be taken in the same fashion as, as when you have change that is coming um, as, 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 a, as a, a solution or as a mitigation to calamity like, like COVID. But you need to, to make sure that you put in place all the change management um, strategies. For instance, you will need to start small by small. small you need to take baby steps in, in implementing change. It needs to be gradual. It doesn't have to be just tomorrow we are switching immediately to a complete new thing. So, and we need to also acknowledge that naturally people are prone to resist, to resist change in all contexts. It's not only limited to education or to TV, but in all wider contexts, people are prone and they are, they are, they, they, they are lucky to, to resist change. The own us is on the change management uh, or the change agents or the executives or the, you need to get the buy-in. You need to identify, for example, change champions. And you know, you need to, 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 to use these change champions and, and, and then see how to progress. Like, okay, the targets can be by, by next month, we are completely changing to, to for example, um, blended. The, 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 ask, the, the strategy should be, okay, um, by next year, we, by next semester, we will move 30% of our teaching to, to blend it, and April. then we will move on. I'll ask we, you to stop there, because you yeah. raised some very important points, but there are other people who also need to um, say their perspective. So we are moving from this um, perspective where we had from Walubita saying, you need to bring people on board, you need to provide the training, you need to show the benefits. Your perspective, um, Gabriel, which is about change management and that 
you want a change which can be perceived as gradual rather than very quick and very traumatic. Chilunda, what's your perspective? Uh, uh, my perspective of uh, uh, the very question at hand is uh, to impart knowledge in uh, people who resist change. Uh, looking at a situation where uh, people have been subjected to something new, always there's a, there's a resistance, but with time and uh, if, uh, the importance of the same uh, techno technology enabled learning has been emphasized, I'm pretty sure people tend to appreciate and if examples are given concerning the same, people would really see the importance and the need. For example, we talk of countries like uh, uh, Korea where uh, pupils as well as students can be as far as home, but they're able to learn. And looking at such countries, they're developing each and every day. So looking at a country like Zambia, where we are a developing country and given examples of uh, developed countries, I'm pretty sure people would really see the importance and with time, they will shift gradually. So that is all I have to say and thank you. Thanks, Chilundi. You don't see the possibility that for some people you might just end up waiting till they retire um, and then there'll be new people coming in who are more receptive to change. Uh, most definitely, we might uh, <laughs> find such people in institutions. And uh, looking at that situation, uh, when we, okay, um, it is not everyone who might be in support of uh, emotion or change. So as an institution, it is quite important you quickly identify those people who are peers and those people who really need time or maybe they're not really interested. The most important thing is putting people on board and with time, those who are peers would tend to uh, have much influence on those who are just on the bench. So I, I believe what is really important is implementing and as long as you have people who are really seeing the importance, for those who wait for retirement, I don't think it's might quite of a, of a challenge, but with time, they might tend to appreciate uh, the, the, um, the change. Thank you, Chilunda. Let's see if there are any other participants who have a perspective on this question, um, either to build on what was said by previous participants or to have a very different perspective. Um, please feel free to raise your hand or to take the mic. Anyone with a different perspective here? And uh, Tony, as, as we look at uh, who are on the same aspect and as we wait for someone else to give in their perspective, um, I want to throw in something in that. Who should be responsible for that change? Who should start the change? Who should take the initiative? Is it government? Is it the, the institutions themselves? Uh, or who should take that, uh, that responsibility of, take, of, of making that change happen? Uh, number two, um, a lot has been said by the participants who have talked, they've said uh, that there should be, once people see the benefits, once people see something work, uh, then they probably change the way they look at it. Whereas that is correct and it is true. Who will do this so that others are able to see for them to be able to change? Thank you. Whose responsibility is it? Who should take the lead? I know many people here are in the TVET sector. So do you see it as your responsibility? Do you see it as somebody else's responsibility? And if it's somebody else's, whose is it? Just take the mic, please. Uh, to begin with, I would say, first of all, it should be the government. Why? Because when the government puts emphasis on uh, change, definitely you discover to say institutional heads will quickly adapt to that and try to implement those. And the second part should be the institutional heads. For example, uh, looking at our institution, I cannot make a decision and try to influence our head being the principal to, to, to make such a change unless they truly see the benefit of that. But looking at when we put the government in place, whereas uh, per, uh, perhaps a directive is coming from the, minister, uh, the, the ministry, we we'll discover to say the institution ahead will have no uh, option, but rather to follow what the ministry is saying or rather the government is saying. And in as much as that is done, us on the lower ground or on the base will be able now to, 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 to push in and um, uh, do things right such that the change is, uh, is, 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 is there, I submit, thank you.
Okay, let's throw it back to Gabriel. Connie Uma, um, as somebody who is working in the ministry and is trying to influence the direction of change in the Tibet institutions, do you believe that you and your colleagues in the ministry have the primary responsibility for making these changes happen? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, maybe it's one of those questions that would have a yes and no answer. Yes, in, in the sense that uh, institutions tend to follow, at least in Zambia, the directives and uh, the, yeah, the directives that come from government. But uh, what I would say no is that, of course, sometimes if institutions are forced to do what they're not yet ready to do, even if they have all the equipment and technology, they will not do it. So it's a, a case of where it can be both ways. The, we can still lead the change and support others uh, to do what is required. But institutions, if they, they are the ones that are implementing, they know what works well and uh, what doesn't work. So police can also be informed by what is happening on the ground. So both ways, I think where institutions see that this can work, they should not wait for directives, but implement and then seek support to improve their implementation. I've noticed that uh, I think Dennis had a hand raised up. Dennis, talk to us. Okay. Um, uh, Gabriel has mentioned some of the things I wanted to say. Uh, I, I look at it more of a holistic. You don't just leave it for the policymakers or the people in government. There's need for evidence because some of the people in government, they will not act until there's some evidence that this thing can actually work. So they, there's need for some people on the ground, they, the ones who actually implement the change. If they can actually document the, the change that is there, maybe through some studies that they have conducted, there's need for empirical evidence so that even as we're trying to lobby for, for this change, there's actually evidence that these are the benefits. And even for, for, for those, um, is it the, the, some of the negative thoughts that people have about this change, if they can be uh, some, this mechanisms that people have come up across where there are, there are some mitigation measures that they have been carried out so as to address some of the challenges that are associated with this change. It's important for that also to be documented so that there's, there's need for informed decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Dines. Thank you for talking about an integrated approach where the people on the ground need to take action, gather evidence, make things happen, um, hopefully with support from government as well, because without that kind of support, the change is going to be very, very difficult. Um, we are at now one past the hour. I know that you may have other events or meetings that you need to go to. In the chat, I have put the link for a survey for feedback from this event, and we would really value your feedback about how your experience of this event has gone. It will not take you long. It would just take you a couple of minutes to complete the survey. Um, I've also put the link to the Emerge Africa website for more events from Emerge Africa. We will put the information up there and also in our Facebook group. I want to say thank you so much to Esther Gachicho and to Gabriel Konayuma, our two experts on TVET for leading this event, for your information, for your inputs, for your questions. Um, and we'll formally bring this to a close, but we'll keep the room open for a bit if you want to continue, if people want to continue the conversation. So any overview comments from you, Esther and Gabriel? Um, yes, uh, maybe what I would want to say is that uh, this transformation is a concerted effort by all of us, uh, that we need to um, help and support each other to get to that transformation that we are looking into. 
it is still a new phenomena in most parts of the of the of Africa and not so many people have been able to embrace it. We've just talked about how difficult it is for people to change from what they are used to, what works. And the only thing right now we can say has worked a little bit in the favor towards it is because of the pandemic that happened that made us realize we'd have to rethink how we do stuff or how we do things. So my appeal would be for us to work, um, to work together and see how we can help transform our Tibet sector and adopt uh, technology in, 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 the, in, in the process of training and learn from those who have been able to do so if they can share and hold hands with those who are trying. How can we, how can we work out that kind of an arrangement? How do we, for those who have succeeded, what did you do? How did you make the change happen? Who played the biggest role in, 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 in starting off this kind of uh, experience? What were the mistakes that you made or the, 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 the holes that you got into and how did you get the, out of them? That way, uh, if you could help us do that, then uh, we'd all walk, walk towards the same uh, vision. And probably Image Africa could be a place and a space to share these kind of uh, ideas and thoughts and forge a way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, I'm wondering if any of the participants in the room have any closing reflections, either in the chat, with your voice, any insights, any reflections after being in this meeting. All yours. Okay, if not, then I'm going uh, to ask a, you, Gabriel. Just a quick one, uh, Tony, yes. Uh, maybe just to say that if, uh, as Esther was sharing about the experiences of Kenya, I say that it's almost like what we have in Zambia, of course, Tibet is looked upon as second class when people cannot go elsewhere. And uh, actually the figures are quite scary. Um, I'm, I was reading the other day, almost 2.5 million of the population are less than 25. And not many of these are in any form of tertiary education. Very few are employed. So the demand for the Tibet sector, apart from the tertiary education in general, are so high because these people require skills. And it's possible that the use of ICTs in education could be a way to actually increase access to make people who would otherwise not have access to skills training, uh, get that access. Like here in Zambia, I'm sure the others in the audience who will be aware, we have the Constituents Development Fund that's been implemented. And it, it has seen an increase in the number of enrollments in some Tibet colleges. But the challenge now lies that the lecturers will be overstretched, the equipment is inadequate, even the infrastructure. So this is where now we need to ask, could technology help alleviate some of these challenges that we're facing and if it could just how can it do so thank you okay gabriel thank you maybe you come back for another webinar with examples of how technology and where the participants share examples of how technology has alleviated these issues how about that hmm uh, that's great idea thought, yes Okay, we've got, we've got witnesses here, so we'll hold you to this. Um, okay, we're, let's, let's um, wrap up. And I would like to ask if we can just switch our cameras on just for a few seconds to notice each other's faces across the continent and in, even for some person across to the US as well. And say cheers, goodbye until we meet again. Nice to see our colleagues. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Hope to see you soon at another Emerge Africa event.